the immigrant and the uh, and the exile, the criminal that stood in the box. Of course, we've seen this already in Lisa Grass's number of times. He who has been famous and he who shall be famous after today. Is that Whitman? Is that who he's talking about? The stammer uh, only, uh, only uses in this poem of that word, again in passage 7. The stammer, the well-formed person, the wasted or feeble person. Again, we're back to Antipodes. I am she. By the way, our Nortons will say now with this I am she. In this episode, there seems to be three identities, she, the lover, and the darkness, a profound generative force of which she is aware before and after the lover is received. This is a brilliant part of the poem. I am she who adorned herself and folded her hair expectantly. My truant lover has come and it's dark. Double yourself and receive me, darkness. Receive me and my lover too. He will not let me go without him. Now, uh, this is obviously can be read both literally and metaphorically. I roll myself upon you as upon a bed. I resign myself to the dust. This I resign myself takes us back to Windresser. He whom I call answers me and takes the place of my lover. He rises with me silently from the bed. Notice the use of darkness again and again. Darkness, you are gentler than my lover. His flesh was sweaty and panting. I feel the hot moisture yet that he left me. And of course, again, guys, I cannot emphasize the erotic nature of these lines in 1855 when it's first released. It's just, it's rad. It's, it's the reason why people called it pornographic and threw it in the fire, for example, any number of, uh, of readers we think of who saw this as not the most wholesome of literature. My hands are spread forth. I pass them in all directions. I would sound up the shadowy shore to which you are journeying. And then all of a sudden, be careful, darkness, exclamation point. Already, what was it touched me? I thought my lover had gone, else darkness and he are one. I hear the heartbeat. I follow. I fade away. I fade away is used one time in all these of grass. And it's right here. Although, go back and look at the last lines of passage 52 of Song of Myself, and you're going to get to play some of this game. Now, with passage number two, um, uh, um, Norton's will tell us, with this line, that is to say, I descend my western course, uh, with this line, the poet begins to identify himself with a series of dream episodes in which death and loss are projected by the struggle of the brave swimmer, the wrecked ship, and in three scenes from actuality, the battle at Brooklyn Heights, the farewell of Washington to his troops, and the visit of the Red Squaw to the old homestead. With Western course, the concept of the movement of race and culture from east to west was generally reflected in Leaves of Grass, for example, facing west from California shore. We commented on that already. Sounding very much like Dante, sounding very much uh, uh, like T.S. Eliot's uh, Burt Norton three, descend lower, descend only into the world, a perpetual solitude, world not world, but that which is not world, internal darkness. Um, here, notice, I descend my western course, my sinews are flaccid, and flaccid here may have the sense of flexible, okay? Perfume and youth course through me, and I am there. Wait, it is uh, my face. Yellow and wrinkled. Notice we go from youth to now old age. But again, Antipodes. Youth. Uh, uh, it, it is my faith, uh, face. Yellow and wrinkled instead of the old woman's. And then these brilliant images. I sit low in a straw bottom chair. In passage six, it's going to be a rush bottom chair. And carefully darn my grandson's stocking. So now he's a grandma. It is I too, the sleepless widow. Looking out on the winter midnight, I see the sparkles of starshine on the icy and pallid earth, taking us back to, of course, sparkles from the wheel. A shroud I see. You'll remember this from Song of Myself 48. Whoever walks uh, to his own grave uh, without sympathy walks, uh, without, uh, uh, walks in his own shroud. A shroud I see, and I am the shroud. Of course, Whitman saw a lot of shrouds. He saw a lot of dead bodies during his time as a nurse during the Civil War, right? I wrap a body and lie in the coffin. It's dark here underground. It's not evil or pain here. It's blank here for reasons. Now, I can't help but think about those famous lines in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern that did Tom Stopart's classic with this. Again, it's this theodicy argument that he makes in Song of Myself 6 that to die is luckier than what anyone supposed. And then in parenthetics, he'll come back to the I see, it, it seems, construction of Song of Myself 6. It seems to me that everything in the light and air ought to be happy. Whoever is not in his coffin in the dark grave, let him know he has enough. Now, there it is. I mean, there's this, there's this theodicy, right? Why did this happen for me? Now, we're going to get a series of amazing imagery. In passage three, it's going to be this drowning swimmer, right? And as we said in Stevie's, uh, Stevie Smith's poem, um, Not Waving, But Drowning, that 
Drowning and swimming look awfully alike right up until the moment that the lungs start to fill up with water, right? And I think that's true literally, but it's also true metaphorically. And I think here, watch the genius of this imagery. I see a beautiful, gigantic swimmer swimming naked, takes us back to Song of Myself 11, through the eddies of the sea. His brown hair, you'll, you'll remember this with Song of Myself 46, laughingly dashed with the hair, but now notice, his brown hair lies close and even to his head. He strikes out with his courageous arms. He urges himself with his legs. I see his white body. I see his undaunted eyes. You'll remember undaunted from Song of Joys. I hate the swift running eddies that would dash him head foremost on the rocks. And the brilliance of using the word dash this way, but later in Song of Myself 46, he will suggests that dashing of the hair is in fact what he wants to see. Do you want to see swimming out in the deepest parts or no? We saw this in Passage to India as well. And the answer is, well, yeah, but when you go out there, something bad could happen. What are you doing, you roughly red trickled waves? Will you kill the courageous giant? Will you kill him in the prime of his middle age? This is, of course, the prayer of Columbus, a uh, question of theodicy. Steady and long he struggles. Again, we're back to theodicy. He's baffled, banged, bruised. We've seen all of those B words throughout Leaves of Grass. He holds out while his strength holds out. The slapping eddies are spotted with his blood. They bear him away. They roll him, swing him, turn him. These are all lang uh, terms that could be used sexually earlier or later in the poem. But now it's what the waves are doing to our poor swimmer who is drowning. His beautiful body is born in the circling eddies. You'll remember this uh, circling eddies from I Sing the Body Electric 9. It is continually bruised on rocks, swiftly and out of sight is born the brave corpse. And there it is. That's the end of the passage. It's a compelling passage. It just sits in the middle of this poem. There you are seeing him trying, trying to get back to shore, and he can't do it. Now, obviously, you can read this literally, but you can also read it metaphorically, no question. Passage six, uh, four is a shipwreck, and we've seen this a number of times already in Leaves of Grass. Whitman obviously saw several times this happen, where we're going to end up with corpses in a barn. I turn, but do not extricate myself. Confused, a past reading, another, but with darkness yet. The beach is cut by the razory ice wind and the wreck guns sound. The tempest lulls. The moon comes floundering through the drifts. Um, you'll, I, I love that he uses the word tempest here. You'll think, of course, of Shakespeare's 1611 offering, the tempest. And in some ways, maybe Whitman put sleepers here as his, if you can say it this way, his tempest, although we'll get to fancy here in 150 poems, and then you can make the argument for yourself. I look where the ship helplessly heads on. Notice all these helpless kinds of ideas in these sections. I hear the burst as she strikes. I hear the howls of dismay. We obviously think of Ginsburg. Every time we think of Whitman and Howells, Song of Broad X, you'll remember uh, number three, the death howl. I hear the howls of dismay. They grow fainter and fainter. I cannot aid with my wringing hands. Remember this from I stand and look out. See here, it's silent. Remember this. I can but rush to the surf and let it drench me and freeze upon me. In other words, the impossibility when you are met with the worst imaginable pain, suffering, sorrow, and you can do nothing other than pick up the pieces. I search with the crowd. Uh, not one of the company is washed to us alive. In the morning, I help pick up the dead and lay them in rows in a barn. And there it is. Notice these images in so powerfully. By the way, later in passage 7, we're going to be talking about filling up a barn, but it isn't going to be with corpses. Now in passage 5, we are, Norton's going, is going to tell us, in passage 5, we are working with a very famous uh, word picture that Whitman's readers would know intuitively. We've already commented on his love of Washington. After the Battle of Brooklyn Heights, August 2, 7, 1776, in which the Americans were decisively de uh, worsted, defeated, Washington skillfully managed to ferry his troops across to New York to prevent total disaster. Whitman wrote of the episode in his Brooklynania sketches. Now, the, uh, we've seen some of this, is, of course, already. Centenarian story comes to mind. Let's play the game with the word now. Now, of the older war days, that is to say, not the Civil War, but the war before, the defeated Brooklyn, Washington stands, notice the present tense, Washington stands inside the lines. I think this is where we learn so well. If you want to be a great poet, read Leaves of Grass. Why? You learn how to show instead of tell. Washington stands inside the lines. He stands on the entrenched hills amid a crowd of officers. His face is cold and damp. He can't repress, he cannot repress the weeping drops. He lifts the glass perpetually to his eyes. The color is blanched from his cheeks. He sees the slaughter of the southern braves confided to him by their parents. I don't think there's any 
unintentionality. I think this is fully intentional by Whitman to talk about Southern Braves because here, of course, we're, we're writing and putting this poem in place after drum taps. The same at last and at last when peace is declared. I, mean, I think the word same here takes us back to our antipodes. He stands in the room of the old tavern, the well-beloved soldiers all pass through, the officers speechless and slow draw near in their turns. The chief encircles their necks. I told you guys about this hugging motif. With his arm and kisses them on the cheek. You'll remember this, of course, from Song of Myself 46. I kiss you with a goodbye kiss and open the gate for eager sense. He kisses lightly the wet cheeks one after another. He shakes hands and bids goodbye to the army. Now, this I find fascinating. This use of Washington, you'll remember Virginia the West. This use of Washington as an exemplar of what it means to live out Whitman's theodicy. Washington, our great American, that we look at and say, now there is an exemplar of what it means to suffer defeat with grace and to somehow find your way to the other side. Well, yeah, but there's all these things we can say about Washington that's wrong with him. Antipodes. There it is. Antipodes. Of course we can. But we got to take Washington as the full man. And when we do that, we've got some respect that can be paid. The sixth passage here is truly remarkable. Go to another now. It's almost as if he's flipping pages of photographs. That's how his audience would have thought about it soon after the invention, so, the prevalence of so many photographs. Today we would think about it as watching videos maybe on some platform. Now, and this is a controversial set of lines as well, today uh, as well as when they were published. Now what my mother told me, we talked about Whitman and his relationship to his mother. Now what my mother told me one day as we sat at dinner together or when she was a nearly grown girl living uh, home with her parents on the old homestead. Notice these, these two passages, uh, five and six, go back in time. A red squaw, you'll remember this from Song of Myself 15. A red squaw came one breakfast time to the old homestead. On her back she carried a bundle of rushes for rush bottoming chairs. We saw, of course, this with straw bottom chairs in passage two. Her hair, straight, shiny, coarse, black, profuse. This, notice these adjectives are celebratory. Half enveloped her face. Her step was free and elastic with her voice, and her voice sounded exquisitely as she spoke. My mother looked in delight and amazement at the stranger. That is to say, how do you respond to the foreign? How do you respond to the different? How do you respond to people that don't fit inside of your simple prism of what normal is? Here we'll play this game. And notice, he learned this from his mother. Right? She looked at the freshness of her tall, born face and full and pliant limbs. The more she looked upon her, she loved her. Again, Whitman's inclusivity is an amazing thing, especially for the time he's writing and publishing this. Never before had she, her mother, seen such wonderful beauty and purity. She made her sit. Now, this, uh, this is interesting. She made her sit on a bench by the jam of the fireplace. She cooked food for her. Takes us back to the Gospel Matthew chapter 25, 40. As, in as much as you've done it for one of these least, you've done it for me. She cooked food for her. She had no work to give her, but she gave her remembrance and fondness. The red squaw stayed, four times in Leaves of Grass, this word stayed is used. Stayed all the forenoon and toward the middle of the afternoon she went away. Oh, my mother was loath to have her go away. All the week she thought of her. She watched for her many a month. She remembered her many a winter and many a summer, but the red squaw never came, nor was heard of there again. Well, what is it that all of these images have in common? Well, obviously, they're about loss. They're about not getting the thing you ultimately hope that you can get. Some have read these losses as political. Some have read them as erotic sexual. Some have seen them as psychological. I'll let you run all of that research to ground. Scholars have spent a lot of time with this poem, reading it at multiply different levels, which is why we talk about our five P's of Whitman, right? That is to say, you can see so many different perspectives when you pick up Leaves of Grass as Whitman is playing the game. Certainly, philosopher is one of them, no question. Now, passage 7 and 8 will be read together, and our Nortons will give us this information that begins with a show of the summer softness. The final two sections, now Nortons, the final two sections, 8 and 9, illustrate the great theme of return and retrievement under the menstruation of the night, the mother in whom the poet lay so long and in whom he loves as much as he does the rich running day. 
Norton's will suggest that we compare these last lines of, 11, of, of 177 to 184 with the earlier passage on darkness from 46 to 54. Now, this, I, I find this just an amazing, amazing play of the game of Antipodes. A show, you'll remember this from Proud Music of the Storm, of the summer softness, we're going to get to summer again, a contract of something unseen. Hear all the S sounds in this? An amour of the light and air. I am jealous and overwhelmed with friendliness. His use of the word jealous is compelling. And will go gallivant with the light and air myself. Gallivant has sexual renderings. It's only used one time in all leaves of grass. It's right here. Oh, love in summer, you are in the dreams and in me. Autumn and winter are in the dreams. The farmer goes with his thrift. The droves and crops increase. The barns are well filled. Now, again, this is amazing given the word picture that we had in passage 4, right, of dead bodies in a barn. And we've seen filled barns as being a representative, a model of what for Whitman America is, filled barns. Elements merge. Think of idolos. Elements merge. Again, this hugging word picture. Elements merge in the night. Ships make tacks in the dreams. The sailor sails. The exile returns home. The fugitive returns home. Unharmed, the immigrant is back beyond months and years. The poor Irishman, by the way, this is the only use of, uh, of uh, poor Irishman in all these of grass. You'll go back to sing old, old Ireland, uh, old Ireland um, again, the only poem about the Irish. And here all of a sudden it gets used, and now we're going to get several other, we're going to get several other immigrant uh, countries being referenced here. The poor Irishman lives in the simple house of his childhood with the well-known neighbors and faces. They warmly welcome him, this idea of inclusivity. He's barefoot again. He forgets he is well off. The Dutchman voyages home again. All this coming home now, word pictures. The Scotchman and the Welshman voyage home. The native of the Mediterranean voyages home. To every point of England, France, Spain, enter well-filled ships. The Swiss foots it toward the hills. The Prussian goes his way. The Hungarian his way. The Pole his way. The Swede returns. The Dane and the Norwegian return. The homeward bound and the outward bound. By the way, homeward bound is only used one time in Lisa Grass. It's right here. The homeward bound and the outward bound. Obviously, we think about the concluding lines of passage to India, further, further sail. The beautiful lost swimmer. Now we're just going to get lists of all the of all the people. And here's the cataloging of the cataloging, right? The beautiful lost swimmer, the ennuyé, the onists, again, this com controversial use of that term. The female that loves unrequited, the moneymaker, the actor and actress, those through with their parts and those waiting to commence. The affectionate boy, the husband and wife, the voter, the nominee that is chosen, the nominee that's failed. We often forget about that. The individuals who run for political office and they don't win. And to what degree do, you, do, do they get to live with that loss? The great already known, the great any time after today. Again, it's Whitman thinking of himself. The stammer, the sick, the perfect form, the homely, the criminal that stood in the box, the judge that sat and sentenced them, the fluent lawyers, the jury, the audience, the laughter and weeper, the dancer, the midnight widow, the red squaw, and now he's going to get to some illnesses as well, the consumptive, the irascipulate, uh, mess around with swine disease, the uh, idiot, he that is wronged, and then there's the use of the word. The antipodes. And everyone between this and them, in the dark. I swear, again that construction of I swear we've seen so many times on these across, I say, I swear, they are average. Don't remember this from starting from Pominoc 10. Divine average, averaged now. And I think that's what he means. I think Lisa Grass is the attempt to try to average the antipodes. There it is. If you want one line to tell you what Lisa Grass is actually about, that's it to me. The attempt to try to average the antipodes, the opposites. One is no better than the other. This is the inclusivity. The night and sleep have likened them and restored them. Then. Now, of course, there's so many ways to read this idea. But for Whitman, sleep is a perfect exemplar of what we all have to do at some point in the course of our day or days. Right? We, we, we'll die if we don't get our sleep. Okay? And as we've often said to students, that may be the most important thing after McGee's homework. No, just kidding. But, yeah, you've got to get your sleep, right? Notice here, in sleep, we're all equal. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are, how poor you are. It doesn't matter what you've accomplished. We all have to sleep. So sleep is that wonderful kind of averaging word picture. And yet, notice how in Leaves of Grass, just like Thoreau's use of it in Walden, sleeping and awakening are often two different things. In other words, there has to be a recognition of the value of sleep. The only way you can do that is to be awake. This dance back, back and forth between the two. Notice the restorative 
type of thing as well. I think he learned some of this from uh, from Wordsworth's Ten Turn Abbey. That idea of um, um, these these uh, feelings too of unremembered pleasure that are restorative. We talk about that already at LearnStrong.net. And then now we'll get this. I swear one more time. Twenty four times in Leaves of Grass, he'll play this I swear thing. I swear. All the things I've talked about, both sides of the antipodes. I swear they're all beautiful. Notice his use of the word all. All beautiful. Everyone that sleeps is beautiful. Everything in the dim light is beautiful. The wildest and bloodiest is over. And all is peace. That phrase, all is peace, is used one time in all these of grass, and it's right here, right now. And I think it's significant. That sleepers, this poem, is placed right here in Lisa Grass. And for those of you who have read all of the lines of Lisa Grass to this moment, you can kind of nod and say, you know, it's true. There's kind of a summation that's going on here that's quite compelling. The universe of imagery that has been Lisa Grass somehow becomes balanced, restored. All is a peace. And then he says it. Peace is always beautiful. I, it's, some, some people say it's the best line of all Lisa Grass. Peace is always beautiful. The myth of heaven indicates peace and night. It's interesting his use of the word he uh, myth here. And, and then, of course, to follow it up with the idea of heaven. Um, the myth of heaven indicates the soul. Taking us back, of course, to passage uh, 48 of Song of Myself. The soul, now he's back to it. The soul is always beautiful, right? It appears more or it appears less. It comes or it lags behind. It comes from its embowered garden. Obviously, we're thinking now about Milton and Paradise Lost. And looks pleasantly on itself. Obviously, there's your Eve reference. And encloses the world. I told you about his views of hugging, clasp, clasping, enclosing. Perfect and clean, the genitals previously jetting. And perfect and clean, the womb cohering. Now, you'll remember genitals from Song of Myself 24. Soft, tickling genitals rub against me. Um, again, of course, this is controversial for its day. I mean, we, do, we look at it kind of like, uh, oh, whatever. But for its time, pretty radical. And, of course, we can be speaking literally or metaphorically, right? That is to say, what is it that engenders, Genesis engenders, the beginning of all humankind? Well, it's got to be, obviously, some kind of 